In 1969, Canada's newest hydrofoil opened up the throttle, reached a speed of 117 km per hour, and became the fastest ocean-going warship in history. At these speeds and standing on its winged legs, it was more like an airplane than a ship. It was the HMCS Brador, the pinnacle of a long history of Canadian hydrofoil development. Hydrofoil research in Canada began all the way back in 1908 in Bedeck, Nova Scotia. There, famed inventor Alexander Graham Bell, along with his wife Mabel and their friend F.W. Casey Baldwin, took up hydrofoil research as one of their pet projects. Baldwin was an engineer and aviation enthusiast from Toronto. The group had previously found success designing and building the Silver Dart, the first controlled powered flying machine in Canada. Bell and Baldwin then looked to hydrofoil technology as a possible way to facilitate their takeoffs and landings on water. Their research was based on the pioneering work done by Italian inventor Enrico Forlanini. Instead of pushing a wide hull through the water, small underwater wings could provide enough lift to raise the hull completely out of the water. This method reduced friction and drastically increased speeds. Bell and Baldwin built and tested several models and prototypes, culminating in the Hydrodome No. 4, or HD4. On September 9, 1919, the HD4 set a world maritime speed record of 114 km per hour on Lake Brador near Bell's home in Bedeck. Their creation only held the record for a year before it was broken by an American team. What remains of the HD4, as well as a full-size replica, can now be found at the Alexander Graham Bell Museum in Bedeck, Nova Scotia. In 1943, Casey Baldwin was once again working on hydrofoils. He looked into the idea of using disposable, foil-borne, remote-controlled boats to lay down smoke screens during amphibious landings on behalf of the Canadian Army. The fruits of his labors were called Comox boats. They were 6 meters in length and could reach 65 kilometers per hour. A few prototypes were delivered before the end of the war, but they never progressed beyond testing. In 1947, Philip Rhodes designed and built a 14-meter craft in Montreal, Quebec, to challenge the world speed record. The top brass at the Royal Canadian Navy were intrigued. They thought hydrofoils could be the next great marine innovation, and they wanted a piece of it. The ship was bought in 1949, and the design was transferred to the Defense Research Board for further development. It was modified and rebuilt by the DBR, who renamed it the R-100 Massawippi. Beginning in January 1950, the R-100 would be used to investigate the performance of ladder-style foils at various speeds and weight loads. The testing occurred in the waters around Halifax Harbor. Responsibility for hydrofoil research was transferred to the NRE, that's the Naval Research Establishment, in 1951. Their first task was to initiate a contract with Saunders Row in England to design and build the R-100's follow-up prototype. Meanwhile, in 1952, the R-100 underwent a refit. Its weight was increased from 3,600 kilograms to 5,400 kilograms to better reflect the loads expected in an operationally ready vessel. It was at these weights that problems began to show themselves. The ship was unstable and had a tendency to porpoise up and down, but perhaps more troubling was the damage being caused to the ship's foils due to cavitation. Cavitation occurs when the pressure of a fluid drops below its vaporization pressure. This results in the formation of bubbles. When these bubbles collapse, they give off a powerful shock wave that can damage nearby objects such as foils or propeller blades. Cavitation is nearly unavoidable at the desired speeds, and so techniques had to be developed to manage them. Different foil profiles produce different effects. Subcavitating foils motivate the bubbles far behind the surface where their collapse won't cause any damage. Supercavitating foils try to maintain the bubble and to shape them in such a way as to produce a positive effect. Propellers are typically designed with supercavitation profiles. The Masuwippi crashed in 1953 and was severely damaged. It was rebuilt and tests continued through 1955 showing similar results. It was around this time that the NRE started looking for alternatives to this problematic design. Saunders Rowe submitted their designs for the R101 and R102 in 1953, but both were rejected due to stability concerns. They went back to the drawing board for the R103. 
Back in Canada, researchers had been testing scale models of different styles of foils. Their research showed promise, and so a new prototype called the RX was built to test out the new configuration, but we'll come back to that. By 1956, the Masawippi was back with new V-style ladder wings. The modifications took almost 18 months, and in that time, its replacement, called the R103, was built in the UK. Due to the delay, it was completed without the redesigned foils, and so testing of the R100 continued until 1959. Following the test, she was retired from service, and can now be found in storage at the Maritime Museum of Quebec. The R-103 was a 100-ton ship of similar configuration to the Massawippi. It was designed by Saunders Rowe in England and built in 1957. After some initial testing, the R-103 was conspicuously loaded onto the deck of the HMCS Bonaventure for their inaugural journeys across the Atlantic. Once in Halifax, the Bonnie exchanged the R-103 for her air wing. The R-103 was tested in Halifax Harbour, but like her predecessors, proved to be unstable on her foils. Testing was focused on developing procedures and refinement of the ladder type foil concept. The R-103 was initially named the Bredor by her builders, but was renamed in 1962 as the Bedeck. This was done to free up the name for the final prototype. It continued its service with the RCN until 1973, when it was finally retired. It now resides in Ottawa, at the Canadian Science and Technology Museum. Back in 1953, and frustrated by the two failed submissions by Saunders Rowe, the NRE was looking for options. They examined the results of the Massawippi, and then researchers at the NRE focused on resolving its stability issues. The NRE had gathered a tremendous amount of data and experience from the R100 project, but they concluded that the problematic ladder-type foils were out, and new diamond-type foils were in. A prototype of the concept was built in 1955 and called the RX. It was built by the NRE and used a completely different foil shape and arrangement. The RX was a 7.6 meter long, 3.5 ton, one quarter scale model of the proposed design. Unlike the previous prototypes, the RX distributed 90% of its weight on the main foils and 10% on the canard type bow foil. The bow foils could be adjusted forward or backwards using a telescoping pole. Movable and hedral fins were mounted on the tips of the main foils. These helped control the roll of the ship when foilborne. Testing of smaller scale models had identified this as a concern when foilborne at low speeds. The design allowed different foil arrangements to be easily accommodated. Particular attention was paid to the anhedral tips, the main foil intersections, and cavitation on the bow foil. Initially, the RX had a ladder type bow foil, but this allegedly broke in a collision with a Russian freighter. I'm sure there's an interesting story there, but I couldn't find the details. The RX was recovered, and her foils were rebuilt in the now familiar diamond configuration. It was used from 1959 onwards, primarily to test de Havilland's analog computer predictions of the proposed FHE 400's foil performance. Testing continued until 1964, when the RX was finally retired from service. It now resides at the Canadian Science and Technology Museum in Ottawa. By 1959, the NRE had concluded its studies and was now ready to move towards developing an actual warship. At the time, by far the biggest military threat that Canada faced was the growing Soviet conventional and ballistic missile submarine fleet. These submarines could sit silently off the North American coast, waiting for orders to strike. To counter this, the RCN invested in a formidable anti-submarine warfare, or ASW fleet, composed of both ships and aircraft. The newly introduced destroyer helicopter combo and the aircraft carrier HMCS Bonaventure with their CP-121 trackers patrolled by sea. From shore bases, the mighty CP-107 Argus and undeployed trackers patrolled from above. Together they formed a strong defense, but the RCN was exploring ways to expand their ASW capabilities without having to further invest in their expensive helicopter destroyer fleet. Sonar was the primary tool used to detect submarines. Since the range of sonar detection is small and the ocean is huge, they were left with either improving the sensitivity of sonars, or deploying a large number of the ones they already had. They went with the latter. 
the concept can be summarized as small and many. The destroyers could be effectively replaced by dozens of small fast ships deploying towed sonar and homing torpedoes. The new ships were expected to spend most of their time moving at slow speeds in the open ocean, using their towed sonar to detect any submarines in the area. Then they would sprint at high speeds to the next location, or attack using their homing torpedoes. Because of these requirements, a ship with good sea keeping at high and low speeds was critically important. At the time, Canada, the US, and the UK were involved in tripartite research into hydrofoil and hovercraft. The UK focused on hovercraft while the others focused on hydrofoils. The Americans preferred the submerged foil type, while the Canadians preferred the surface piercing type. Both had their advantages, but the surface piercing type approach showed more promise for open water travel in rough seas. The US Navy would go on to commission their first hydrofoil, called the High Point, in 1962. This was followed up by the larger Plain View in 1965. These ships, like the Canadian ones, were effectively research prototypes designed to study operational capabilities and not fully deployed warships. In 1959, the NRE had their proposal ready and submitted it to the Government of Canada for approval and funding. The next year, de Havilland Canada was awarded a contract to study the feasibility of a 180-ton hydrofoil. Their study concluded that the concept was sound in a report delivered in 1961. The NRE was satisfied with their concept and confident that de Havilland Canada had the skills necessary to see the program through. It was decided that the aircraft manufacturer would be best suited to serve as the primary contractor for the new hydrofoil, since they were familiar with the construction techniques the engineers intended to use. De Havilland Canada also had an extensive research and development capacity. They would be able to produce the final design and assist in testing of the new ship. Another major contribution was the analog computer used to predict the foil performance in various sea states. By late 1962, de Havilland completed their design work, and a contract to build the ship came soon after. The Bredor was built by Marine Industries Limited in Sorrel, Quebec, starting in 1963. Her hull was 46 meters in length, it had a beam of 6.6 .6 meters, and stood 14.3 meters from the bottom of her foils to the top of the bridge. When cruising at full speed, the foils had a draft of 2.3 meters, and the hull was lifted to 3.2 meters above the water. The hull structure was very similar to that of an aircraft, and so similar construction techniques were used. It was made of welded aluminum, but was lined with acoustic dampening material to keep noise levels down. To assist welding, the hull was built upside down and then turned over on the 22nd of January 1966 to complete its superstructure and attach the foils. Construction proceeded well until a fire in the main engine room broke out in 1966. The fire caused $5.7 million in damages and delayed the program. As a result of the accident, more focus was placed on the ship's firefighting abilities. The FHE-400 was finally completed on July 12, 1968. Eleven days later, she was commissioned by the Royal Canadian Navy as the HMCS Bredor. The new ship incorporated all the lessons learned from the three preceding prototypes. It was designed to have excellent sea-keeping abilities for operations from the North Atlantic to the tropics. The fully loaded weight of the final design was increased from 180 to 215 tons to better reflect operational requirements. Similar to the RX, a canard-type arrangement was found to be best for use of towed sonar and to help with wave contouring. Wave contouring allows smaller ships to ride through larger waves at the expense of crew comfort and complexity. 90% of its weight was placed over the main wings and the remaining weight over the steerable bow foil. The 20 meter wide main foils were of the delayed or subcavitation type. They featured several parts, two anhedral foils, two movable anhedral tips, and two dihedral foils connected by a center foil. Fences, small pointed tips, and other surface features helped motivate the bubbles away from the foil body and control unwanted ventilation. Ventilation occurs when air from the surface rushes into the partial vacuum of the cavitation bubble. This ventilation will grow the cavitation bubble, degrading the lifting effect and damaging the surfaces. 
The steerable front foil featured a diamond-shaped, supercavitating, hyperventilating type foil with a strut down the middle. Its rotation provided steering control in both hullborn and foilborn operation. The angle of incidence could be adjusted to provide optimal pitch response through its speed range. The foils were built with super strong 18% nickel merging steel to resist cavitation damage. It also had replaceable leading edges. It had two propulsion systems. A 2400 horsepower Paxman 16 YJCM high-speed diesel motor ran two low-speed propellers for efficient hull-borne travel. A more powerful 30,000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney FT4A-2 gas turbine engine ran two high-speed props for foil-borne travel. The large air intake for the turbine took up a large part of the upper deck. Accommodations on board were minimal but comfortable for her normal crew of 20. This could be expanded to a maximum of 25. There were three decks. The lowermost deck housed the crew quarters, galley, dining and recreation areas, machinery rooms, a workshop, and stores rooms. There were provisions on board for up to 14 days of independent operation. The space between the lower deck and the hull contained the fuel tanks. The second deck housed the operations room. This is where the navigation, communications, sonar, and fire control equipment was found. The powerful turbine and its huge intake and water separator dominated the main deck. On top of the operations room stood a tiny two-person bridge. Its design was closer to a cramped World War II bomber cockpit than a traditional ship's bridge. The Bredor was unarmed, but its armament was in mind when they designed it. It would have had a towed sonar out the back and a set of torpedo launchers on the aft deck. The increase in weight and shift in the center of gravity this would have caused was built into the prototype. Once a crew had been trained, it was ready for testing around Halifax Harbor. The ship was then loaded onto a barge and sent down the St. Lawrence from Sorrel to Halifax. There, testing would be divided into four phases. Calm water trials, rough water trials, sonar towing, and finally operational fighting equipment trials. Upon its launch, it was found that the transmission for the high-speed propellers was defective. This limited testing of the Bredor to hull-borne trials until September. After that, it was docked and the new transmission was installed. Operations resumed in March 1969, with the first foil-borne run taking place in April. The top speed while hull-borne was a modest 22 km per hour, but foil-borne, it could reach a blazing 117 km per hour. Speed was limited by the cavitation that occurs behind the foils. Any faster and they would buckle. It was found out the hard way that around 110 km per hour was the practical upper limit for hydrofoil ships built of current materials. Beyond that speed, foils operating in the delayed cavitation mode would transition to the damaging supercavitation mode. Inspections in July found serious cracks in the center section of the main foil. A temporary replacement was installed while a new foil set was being fabricated in Quebec. Trials continued until May 1970, when the ship was docked and the new foils installed. Testing continued from October 1970 to June 1971, at which time the Bredor was docked in anticipation of moving on to its next phase. The initial two development phases were just for seagoing operations, but proved to be an overwhelming success. In fact, the Bredor was found to be more stable in rough waters traveling at 70 km per hour than a conventional destroyer traveling at 33. The third stage of development would have been the ASW testing. Designers were confident from the beginning that the overall design was correct for Canada's needs, and so refitting it for an ASW operations was included in the initial design stages. The refit would have involved installing the towed sonar, additional navigation and fire control equipment, as well as the operational firefighting equipment. Unfortunately, this refit never took place. On November 2, 1971, the HMCS Bredor program was cancelled by the Ministry of National Defence. Their reasoning was that the RCN was moving away from a focus on ASW operations and towards that of sovereignty protection. The Bredor just didn't fit into the new paradigm, and its development costs were eating away at an already overstretched defense budget. 
the dream of a fleet of ocean-crossing hydrofoils had officially come to an end. Thankfully, the ship itself was saved from the scrapyard and now resides at the Musée Maritime du Québec in Ilet sur mer Québec. Definitely worth a visit if you're in the area. There was one more hydrofoil that deserves a mention. The Proteus was built by the NRE in 1973 as a versatile testbed for future research. As its name would suggest, the Proteus could change its foil shape. After some initial testing, which confirmed the NRE's previous results, it was relegated to propulsion testing. This continued until 1980, when it was moved into storage. The development of hydrofoils in Canada is a fascinating subject. I would highly encourage those wanting to know more about the details of the design to check out the links in the description. There is a wealth of information out there and we've only scratched the surface here today. The HMCS Brador is probably still the fastest warship in the world, although warship is a loose term as it never received its armament. It was an exciting concept that specialized in addressing a serious defense need. Unfortunately, that need was also addressed by more versatile ships, and Canada, like so many navies across the world, went the route of deploying more destroyers and ASW helicopters. <laughs>